Thank you very much. So let's uh, kick it off by we're going to look at some, uh, some 3D content. First, we're going to take a look at uh, a reel from Ian. So if you have the real D glasses, <clears throat> not to be confused with the Dolby ones, these are the ones that say real D, 3D on the side. Ian, do you want to say anything about uh, these clips before we, uh, before we hit play? Sure. This is a, a little backstory as to how we arrived at this day. Uh, it started about 2009. And we, well, that was the 3D start. And we started the projects that you see up here over about 2007. So we, we captured about four different clips for you. And they were meant to be blown up to the big screen. So we went very conservative on our 3D. But one's a documentary we did for his, uh, National Geographic. Another one uh, we did with Discovery. And another one we did for the Bell Nuvia Fund, which aired just online. And it's a motion graphic novel. And another one which is clips from a, uh, the R&D process that we're doing right now for a, a graphic novel. So we'll take a look at it. Fantastic. That's very nice. So this panel, we're going to talk about independent production and what the realities are of uh, getting a project done, produced, financed. I'm going to show another clip right now off of the, uh, on the uh, big screen. So this is, um, my day job is I'm a, I'm a commercial director and most of the work I do is work for hire, but uh, we also have been doing some independent production. So I'm going to show you a clip of um, a stop motion film that we uh, have shot. It's almost complete. This is sort of the second last pass. There's still some, a few effects to come in color grading, but uh, it's a film called Fox, shot stop motion frame by frame with a 5D uh, in stereoscopic 3D. Are you ready to uh, run it? Okay. So Dolby glasses on this time. Dolby glasses. Coming to a theater near you. Okay, so, so let's start off with, uh, with James. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, your experience in 3D. You, you guys worked on uh, Piranha 3 Double D, yes. I believe. I don't yes. think you wrote that joke, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you worked on that as well. Some of the, uh, I, I don't know how many people here saw what uh, NHK did during the Vancouver Olympics. They, they were shooting and then the next day showing in the, in the Panasonic Pavilion. That was uh, pretty effective. This was, this was in uh, 2010. So mm -hmm. just t tell us a little bit about your, uh, your experience. Well, you know, 3D in Vancouver has been a bit of a love-hate relationship for sure. Um, you know, because we're a, you know, a major production center, we, we were inundated with a lot of, you know, feature film work, and we've certainly had our fair share. Um, and unfortunately, you know, because of who we are, you know, we were serviced a lot by the Paces and by the Paradise Videos for, for daily services. So when Piranha 3 Double D came around, it was, um, it was brought up from the States into Vancouver for, for tax credit uh, purposes, which was, which was great. So uh, at Technicolor, we were able to do the full 3D DI um, and do all the deli de deliverables in 3D. Um, the Olympic uh, Pavilion was a co-production with NHK and Panasonic, and it really did sort of bring 3D into our facility for the first time, which was which was great. So that's sort of my experience. That's great. So so on uh, on Piranha, you did you did uh, stereo dailies, and then in the end, you also did the uh, final stereo grading and and DI work. Well, the dailies were actually it was shot down in North Carolina, oh. so so we did all the all the 3D post here in Vancouver, so the grading and the deliverables. So. That's great. Um, so, Ian, tell us a little bit about some of the, the so you saw on his, on his demo the, uh, the blowdown, I think it's called, which is the, uh, the destruction of a, of a Mexican stadium. Just tell us a little bit about that project and Battle Castle and some of the projects we saw clips of. The, the series is called Blowdown, and it aired on National Geographic, and uh, we've been working on it for a couple of years. Uh, what we did was we did structural implosions of iconic structures, um, you know, Rocket Tower in Cape Canaveral, nuclear cooling towers in the UK, uh, uh, the second largest artificial reef in the world off of Florida Keys, and then the Did you do the Twin Towers? 
No. <laughs> sort of. No, the people that we worked with actually apparently did it, so according to the uh, blogs. Um, and uh, so it was pretty serious stuff, as you can imagine. You know, we had, we had to be uh, balancing our technical with our creative. You know, what's the story going to be and how is the story going to unfold? And you, we had no control over the sites because we were following CDI, which is controlled demolition. Um, we did what we could, and we had uh, perfect access. So this is leading to the 3D. What happened was, while we're shooting that series, and I sent out field directors uh, to do some of the work for us, and and in the process, I went to National Geographic, and I said, you know, we're shooting this series, and and uh, they said, get out of the office. We don't want to talk to you. Okay, fine. I said, take a look at the stuff I've got, and what we did was we put some After Effects work together in 3D. And I, I gave him red-green glasses, it was awful, and he looked at it and he, he said, okay, you, you got to move really quick. Uh, I think we have something here. And we ended up pitching the final episode in uh, 3D, and they accepted it. It, was, it wasn't a deal where it was, you know, we're going to do a, a 3D deal on top of your 2D deal. It was, we're going to do 2D, but you're also going to deliver 3D. So we kind of went in through the back door of 3D with National Geographic. For, on their end of the equation, it was going to be them testing out their pipelines. And for us, it was us testing out our pipelines and then feeding them and then them adjusting to what we had to do. So we picked up the, the sky specs and went for it. So on Blowdown, did you shoot anything 2D or everything was shot 3D? The final episode was all shot 3D native. Okay, and you, did you use one eye for the 2D version? Yeah, we picked off one eye of the cameras. Uh, what happened is, is over the course of the couple of years doing Blowdown, is we ended up doing, uh, you know, we'd put four cameras on the implosion and, you know, we capture something. And then, you know, the next time around, I'd say, well, let's go with eight cameras. And then we'd do eight cameras, and that was a nightmare. And then we went to 16. By the end, we're doing 32 cameras on the implosions. So when it came to the eighth episode and the 3D, uh, the team had by this time been beaten down into submission of, okay, now we're going to add 3D into the mix. And uh, fortunately, I was working with a fantastic stereographer and, who had trained outside of my shop, and, and he said, I'm, I'm, I'm into it, let's do it. And then I had a post guy who actually was able to uh, say, I'll do it, and uh, we got Cineform involved, and we, so we were able to put the pieces in place uh, going into this thing, but it was a year before Sony had launched any of their cameras. And so we we're building actual systems. We weren't building 3D cameras. It was actual systems, which is uh, you know it was uh, pieces of wood, some you know baling wire, and some duct tape. Yeah, what kind of cameras did you use? Like an example on the eight eight rig, 16 camera shoot. How, what kind of cameras were they? Were they? Uh, we had a mixture for the main cameras. We used an Iconics rig. So what we did is we had the computer carried around a backpack and the two eyes in the front with a, this kind of red rock rig in front. Uh, we also used a 5D uh, system where we beam split that. And then the other cameras which captured the implosion was just, you know, uh, we didn't have GoPros at the time. This is before that. So we had a lot of contours and we had a lot of, uh, you know, security cameras that we, we actually ran back to decks. And the decks were a little higher quality. It wasn't a nano drive uh, set up. We used the nano drives for the Iconics. But we used these drives to capture as high quality as we could. So what we do is we in the middle of the stadium, and this was in Brazil, is we set up our main camera records. And then we'd run Cat5 out to, the, out to the cameras around the stadium to capture that. One of the big challenges was keeping the eyes level during the implosion because there's so much violent explosion uh, uh, shaking going on. How many cameras were left uh, after uh, the, the implosion? I don't think we, we came away with pretty much anything after that. Yeah, the cameras weren't close enough if you didn't lose them, right? Um, so back, back to you, James. Talk a little bit about... Uh, so Piranha in, in Canada, in terms of production dollars, Piranha would not be considered a low-budget film. But <clears throat> by Hollywood standards, it's certainly a low-budget film. Tell, tell me about some of the challenges you guys had uh, doing the DI work and the final stereo grading uh, on, you know, I, I don't know which rigs they used on that. If you know, let us know. But the, you know, the challenges of trying to deal with a somewhat low-budget, uh, sure. um, non-Hollywood live-action film. Yeah. Well, as Jim said this morning, you know, doing 3D properly um, will kill you. But doing 3D properly for the Weinsteins not only kills you, it raises you from the dead and then kills you again. <laughs> so, you know, the challenges on... on on Piranha were um, just the multiple cameras that they shot. They shot red, 
Iconix, GoPro, um, a bunch of other cameras, you know, very, I want to say low-end cameras. Um, and it, the challenge there was really bringing all these different elements into, you know, Hollywood-style uh, digital intermediate, and not only Hollywood-style di digital intermediate, but in 3D. So mixing those formats was, was the biggest, <laughs> biggest challenge. Um, so in 3D, you know, normally something well shot, both of your eyes are very, very well balanced, but, you know, because they had a lot of underwater footage and because, because of these lower-end cameras, they often didn't have the time to balance the eyes properly. So the challenge in post was really getting the color correction right and making it so that the eyes were as balanced as possible. So th I think that was the biggest challenge on, on that particular project. Has anybody seen uh, Piranha 3 Double D? <laughs> I have. Come on, you can I admit it. See everything. <laughs> so interestingly enough, and, and it, there's a there's an interesting scene in it, uh, a mermaid scene, where there's these two naked women having this semi-erotic thing underwater. Um, you know, not interesting for the for the subject matter, but interesting in that it's it's an extended scene underwater shot live action, with two sort of human figures mm -hmm. interacting. Um, you know, I actually thought that was uh, kind of interesting to see. Yeah, yeah. They they did a lot of really, actually, really cool things on that in in terms of uh, photography, um, but I think the second biggest challenge was in integrating the visual effects because of the visual effects, it, w it was a fairly heavily you know intensive visual effects project, um, and they were working with multiple vendors, um, and because as you say it was a, it was a lower budget um, Hollywood um, feature. You know, some of the visual effects vendors that they used were, were not were not three D ready. They hadn't done three D before. So, you know, compounding that with actually integrating, you know, visual effects into three D was probably the second biggest challenge. And were all the the piranha fish done by the same same vendor? No, they were. Uh, I think mm -hmm. there were about six vendors in total. So all the piranhas are CG, and you know, at some point they go, you know, right into the camera. Yeah. Um, kind of interesting. Um, so, Ian, tell us a little bit about uh, Battle Castle. So, this is a this is a history uh, discovery production. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. How how the project was conceived, and then how it got from from there into uh, into three D. The uh, during lowdown as well, it, it, we were R and Ding for Battle Castle in two D. So, what we do is we do a lot of visual effects work within our documentaries. So. The battle scenes that we have there, we do against green screen, lots of live action, but a little bit to establish, we have to pull the camera back, and so we do that in After Effects. And so in the process of doing Blowdown, we start to learn about the language, as Buzz has talked about, of 3D. And that was really important, because in order for us to move into Battle Castle, which involved fighting and uh, castles, which are, again, very iconic, um, we used are we, we upped the language and the, and the equipment came along as to what we could use in, in, you know, to get us better 3D. So it was, in this case, it was EX3s into a beam splitter back into nano so we could get our bit rate up. So in the process, uh, 3D started to taper off. We had done our deal with, bl uh, with Blowdown with Nat Geo. Uh, 3Net was launched, and we thought, okay, we're in the gold now. This is going to be easy street for anybody that's done any 3D, and it didn't turn out to be that way at all. We, uh, we got into it, and we shot the first episode. They said, we're going to do three episodes in 3D, and we thought, this is fantastic. And uh, so we invested heavily, and we did the first episode in 3D, and then they pulled out, and uh, it kind of left us in the lurch. But at the same time, uh, we got to know in the process... Uh, a, the language, which is really important, and we're able to combine the technology, which is still very rudimentary for us at the time, with the financing model that we, we came to, which is the 2D, 3D combo that uh, David Bremer is talking about. And, and what happened with 3Net? Why did they pull out? Was it just a timing thing or subject matter, or uh, what was the... What was the issue? Any uh, ideas? It, it wasn't 3Net. 3Net's US, so it was... Oh. Blowdown went down there. It was actually Discover UK, who had an output deal with Sky. And there's, there's the machinations, I think, of we have to make money, and we're not making money off 3D right away, so we're going to pull the plug on this stuff. And, and so what they're doing is they're saying, and I think we've talked about this as well, Sky wants to marry it up with a 2D uh, sale 
and then they trot you over to 3D and see if 3D can kick in a little bit of money to top you up, and then you can go out and do your thing. I don't know how, any, uh, how you know, it, we, we, we came through blowdown, so we had an idea and we built our infrastructure, but if anybody coming in cold on that, I don't know how they do it. Okay, so you touched on an interesting point. Just tell us about, from an independent producer point of view, um, you have a series, it's, it's financed for 2D, you want to do it in 3D, you know, what, what is the actual roadmap from, from there to, you know, bouncing between these 3D broadcasters which may, who may or may not have any kind of real licensing fees to uh, offer? Just tell us kind of what, uh, you know, what is that roadmap from your point of view, from an uh, independent producer point of view? The main thing as a Canadian is we land our Canadian 2D deal first. So we, we go to Shaw and one of their channels and we, we will work, work something out with them. We'll carve out 3D and then we take it down to 3Net and 3Net can uh, come in for a license and that'll top us up. That I think is a workable Canadian model and I'm, I'm very surprised that there isn't more Canadians actually doing it. Because with, with that anchor broadcaster in place in Canada, you can you know pull in four hundred thousand dollars or so, go down to the U.S. and maybe pick up a uh, hundred thousand. But there's no guarantee that Three Net will pick anything up that uh, that we do. Of course, um, they have it has to be fitting American needs, and it also has to actually fit the international needs because they're selling the stuff out. You give the the rights will probably go to them as David has talked about, and then go out to the international. So they're they're treading this fine line of content creation fits the American model. American Midwest also has to fit the UK. You know, it's almost impossible to, to try and hit that, that target. So you can still do a Canadian uh, deal um, and exclude 3D because broadcasters don't care about it or don't know about it or can you, you can still do that? Uh, I think we've I think we can. Uh, I, what we've done is we've done deals where we actually declared to BBC Worldwide that we're going to do 3D. And, and this is complicated. My, my partner can speak more to that. But uh, what they did was they had no interest in 3D, but they held the 3D rights. And we have to clear everything through them before we can actually make a 3D sale internationally. So they don't want it. They're not interested, but they want to tie us up. So you have to negotiate. And do you think, from a production point of view, the model is still shoot 3D, deliver 2D and 3D? Or, or would you shoot, you know, call it 5D, which is a separate crew doing 2D and, and 3D at, at times, maybe some with some overlap? I would shoot 3D native as much as I can. I mean, we, the Sony 300 has now been released. We tested it before Christmas, and it, it really works. There are some limitations around the lenses. Uh, but it's fast. It, it, I can work the creative really fast while the technical is, is going down the road. And because we're run and gun, we're following guys who don't have the time to do it again and they're not going to wait for you. So I say shoot native 3D and produce one eye for the 2D. And I think it, it, it you know, it, again, you know, we've got that, we've had the dates up on the screen. Is it going to be 2015, 2016? Uh, you know, I hate to play the numbers game. I think I take a project by project and go, I need to shoot as much 3D as I possibly can. That's how I jam down um, into my team. Okay. Um, in, in Toronto, we have a lot of, uh, I wouldn't say a lot, but, you know, we have a fair amount of uh, uh, 3D resources. So there's, there's about maybe three, almost three companies that have uh, camera rigs. Um, the, one, the main one, 3D camera company, which you may know about. Um, and there's two or three element technica rigs. Uh, there's a couple of other hybrid rigs. There's no threeality uh, rigs, like the original threeality designed rigs. Um, but there, there is a, a sense that if you can get rigs, you can always fly them in. So James, can you just talk a little bit about the, the Vancouver 3D environment? And you know, if I'm a Vancouver 3D producer and I want to make a 3D film, and I'm going to come and see you guys, and and uh, presumably Deluxe. You know, how how can you deal with the 3D? If I'm not a, a big studio film, how how can you help help me out in terms of post? Well, you know, like I said before, you know, Vancouver, um, you know, unfortunately was was sort of inundated with these 3D features that were serviced by, you know, the LA um, paces and, and the paradises, but. You know, Vancouver is a market we've always quickly recovered from that kind of thing, and you know, and in spite of that, we've we've actually learned a lot about 3D on our own. Um, and 
you know, there are, there's a good talent base here in Vancouver, both in the production side and the, and the post-production side. Um, you know, my facility, the facility I work at, Finale, you know, we, we are Technicolor uh, Color and 3D certified, so, so that really does lend a lot of credibility to, you know, to what we can do in, in, in our facility. Um, you know, Deluxe also has 3D capability, um, and I believe um, Side Street has 3D uh, capability as well. So there, there, there are facilities in Vancouver that, that, that do 3D. Um, in terms of the, of the production side, um, again, you know, the camera suppliers have been, um, have been quick to adopt uh, a lot of the 3D uh, technology and the 3D rigs. So, again, very well supported. But, um, you know, as Ian was saying, you know, the, the cameras themselves are, are getting easier and, and better to actually work with. So, you know, again, acquisition in 3D, I think, is, is still very viable. So if you're, if you're an independent producer and you're thinking of producing 3D content, you have here two stars of the Vancouver 3D community with production depth and post-production depth, and they're saying that uh, it is possible um, to do it. Absolutely. And uh, on that, we're going to go to questions. Don't, don't hold your applause by any means. <laughs> any questions on any topic? I, I do have to interrupt and say uh, it is actually sunny outside. <laughs> And there's snow good, on the mountains. Good to see that. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Just a question about standards of rock. Are there standards of, for example, degrees of parallax or uh, the minimum bit rate for 3D cameras? Because you know, a lot of independents are using, are using low tech sometimes if you get a 3D. But do broadcasters, well, as they do with 2D, have minimum standards for broadcasts? Yeah. Do you want to just talk about the deliverables, uh, Ian? You deliver a 3D show uh, in terms of the spec sheet? I'll, I, I can talk about a bit about production. I, maybe James can talk about the deliverables. The, there is, what we do is we run our material into nano drives, so we get 140 megabytes per second out of it, as opposed to the native 35 or something. Mm -hmm. And there is specs. We've been working off the sky specs, and they're very conservative. Uh, but it's, you know, in this day and age where we're stepping and I, I think it's actually rapidly into 3D. It may not feel it at times, but uh, I think it's a, it's, you know, it works. It gives, because when you go in and see the executives, they're freaking out about where's the 3D, what's gonna happen with it. And then over time, as the conversations, as the last panelists talk about, they become comfortable. So it's part of the psychology shifting with the specs. So that's on the production side, the post-production, well. I have to be careful what, I, what I'm going to say here, but um, it's, you know, and I'm sure there are people that are going to correct me if I'm wrong, but, um, you know, deliverables for, for 3D um, and 3D in general, I found that there haven't been a lot of, you know, hard and fast specifications. Um, someone this morning talked a little bit about, you know, Technicolor wanting to implement a, a 3D certification and that sort of fell flat. Um, you know, Sony, I know, they had a, a system where it would actually tell you, you know, your, your, your depth percentage, uh, negative and positive, and it would, it would give you an alarm, that kind of thing. So there are, I think there are soft specs for sure in terms of deliverables, but again, th this may have changed, and correct me if I'm wrong, any, any experts out there. Um, but when we were doing our deliverables for, you know, the projects that we worked on, um, it really did come down to... Um, I gotta say, what what looked good, um, you know. I think you know there there was a um, there, there's a difference between a, a video deliverable and a theatrical deliverable in terms of um, in terms of your minimum and, and your maximum convergence amount. Um, and we did try and and you know adhere to the theatrical side and then down to the the, the video deliverable side, Blu-ray deliverable side. So again, depending upon your budget, depending upon the scope of your project. You, you might have a requirement to you know, change specs for a theatrical deliver deliverable or for a video deliverable. Um, does that answer your question? I think the main spec is don't hurt people's eyes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I found in, we've done commercials for cinema and, and, and the broadcasters and all, and you know, Cineplex and um, you know, all the cinemas around the world, they have spec sheets that say this is where your 3D has to be. And they generally <laughs> say you know, there, there can't be any negative parallax 
you know, so what we do is I just ignore that and I say, don't worry, it's going to look great, and they accept that. Um, but they, ha they have a spec sheet because they're really terrified that they have all these people delivering content. Some of them know a lot about 3D, some of them don't know anything about 3D. And, you know, in the cinema, you know, before, in the pre-show, there's varying degrees of production value, and so th they're afraid that people are going to deliver absolute crap. So, you know, they say, you know, put, er, put the subject at the screen plane, have no negative parallax, and, um, you know, but what they mean by that is uh, it, it has to look good, or, or, you know, don't hurt people's eyes, don't diverge people's eyes, don't mm -hmm. use misaligned cameras, don't, don't do that kind of thing. Last question, up at the back. Uh, hi, Ian. Yes. Uh, if you were going to be pitching a series to a Canadian broadcaster, uh, albeit in 2D with a potential 3D uh, option, would you approach the broadcaster with a sizzle? Or would you just, like when, when you landed ba um, uh, Battle Castle, did you, how, did you, uh, how did you get the gig? What was your pitch format? Good question. You also you also got a Bell uh, Media Fund uh, mm -hmm. money for the uh, for other platforms. Yeah. Blowdown was the entree, and so what happened is is we did that as 2D, and Canada only saw 2D, except in France, um, not uh, Quebec, where the French language uh, version of the 3D went out, and it was kind of a stunt, and that's the way it is in Canada. It's still a stunt. Um, I, I don't think you'll have much success pitching 3D to an executive in Canada. They won't, they, you know, you could show them a sizzle reel, they'll appreciate it and, and move on because they want, they, they want the ratings within the 2D world. There's nothing happening in 3D in Canada. But if you do a sizzle reel, um, you can show it to 3Net, you can show it to Sky, and you can show it to the Italians. And, uh, you know, you'll probably get, or David, and, you know, maybe into the Asian marketplace. Um, you know, because it seems like in that world, I mean, we're very much locked in on the 44-minute hour in the broadcast world, whereas within the 3D world, it's like 5 minutes, 20 minutes, 26 minutes. It doesn't matter. So if you've got something that's really cool, yeah, do it and pitch it. In Canada, I don't see you uh, much success there. When you did your Bell Fund application, was 3D part of that? Yeah, it was. It was purposely built in. As, um, we wanted to do these motion graphic novels in 3D, and, and again, we worked in the... It, it was another opportunity for us to split out the, the convergence points in multiple ways, because in After Effects, you can have this action and this action in Blood Splatters, which are really cool. I think Danny Novak can talk about that a bit in his career. Um, and, you know, I come honestly from it through, through him. Um, we... So we, we, we built that in, and they accepted that 3D was going to be an experimental part of our equation. And uh, so we were left, you know, it was really to our own devices in that world. Great. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it.